We know that we can come to God in prayer, but how are we to pray? That will be the answer. We'll be hearing the answer during our sermon today, so let us open our Bibles to Luke chapter 11, the first four verses. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us access to God, for allowing us to pray, but also for teaching us to pray. As we hear your word expounded, please work in our hearts. Help us understand. Your word is clear. And forgive us for not coming to you in prayer often enough. We know we ought to pray. But now we can know how to do it properly. Help us to understand. Amen. You may be seated. We still um, are in a good morning time zone, so I want to welcome you to the church, everyone who is here today. I want to invite you to our passage, welcome to you to in this passage. But we, before we dive into our study, I need to share my testimony from this week. And the reason why is because I've been under effect of last Sunday's message. Uh, if you haven't heard last Sunday's message, this is the time when I tell you, please go back when you get home, watch it on YouTube. And I encourage you to watch two services because when I preach, I preach the same sermon in two languages. It's exactly the same, so you can just listen or watch one. But when someone else is preaching, we have two pastors preaching on the same subject, which is always exciting because it's the same meal, it's the same meal served on a different plate, uh, maybe different sauce, under different sauce. So uh, it's always exciting to try uh, the same meal twice, just uh, di served differently. So I encourage you to go back to last Sunday because both messages were so Powerful. I, I actually sat through the first service and then second, and I have to share with you the, the impact it had on me because the messages were so amazing. Um, I've been blessed personally. I want to begin with a story because last uh, Sunday's message was on the story that happened with Martha and Mary and Jesus visiting them and Martha being busy with the, the, the sauces that she was serving on the table and uh, Mary was just listening. She was captivated with Jesus. Mar Martha was busy with other things. And we all know this story. And the main point was keep the main things, main things. You know, priority of fellowship and relationship with God over even good things we do for God. So that was kind of the main storyline of that in the lesson. I want to begin with the story that uh, comes from uh, almost two th 200 years ago, uh, Charles Spurgeon, uh, pastor from London in England, uh, shared this story uh, 150 years ago. He shared the story, interesting story that happened, of course, probably made up story, but still, nevertheless, great lesson. It was a story of a one kingdom, and there was a king, and one of his uh, servants, one of his farmers, once during harvest, discovered a huge carrot. He just pulled out abnormal carrot, huge. He never seen anything like this, and he was like, what should I do with this big carrot? No one ever had such a big carrot. He decided, you know what? I'm going to present this as a gift to my king. I love the king, and I'm going to just come and give it to him. So he, he had a 
to overcome certain things, and he reached the king and says, King, you won't believe. Look at this carrot. I just discovered this in my uh, backyard, in my yard or my orchard, and I want to give it to you as, a, as just a token of my appreciation. I love you. Take it. I, I, I know you're the only one worthy of this uh, carrot. Uh, the king was so touched, so moved by this act of kindness and love, he says, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you all the lands around your backyard. How about that? I'm the king, I own all this land. So I'm going to give you as a gift, all the land around your house as a gift. This guy is shocked, like, wow, okay, he left. Now, of course, he had some officials, high-ranking officials, standing in the room and observing this all, hmm, carrot. Lots of land. You, you know what would you, you would do, right? You start connecting the dots. I would do the same. And so one of the guys, one of uh, his associates, he says, you know what? I am uh, breeding horses. I'm going to give a gift as well. Because I think it, it pays, pays off really well. I mean, you bring carrot and you get lots of land. So the next day he comes and says, King, I know you're a great one and I'm breeding horses, and I decided to give you a nice, beautiful, uh, young black stallion. Stallion, you know, I'm going to just give it as a gift. You know, you're, you're a great king, I love you. Here's, here's the horse as a gift. And no reply. King does nothing, says nothing, and this efficient scratching his head, King, yesterday the guy brought the little carrot, well, big carrot, and you're given so much land, and here is a horse. I mean, comparing to that, and you, you don't even respond. What's going on? And the wise king says, listen, my friend. Yesterday, the farmer gave the carrot to me. Today, you're giving the stallion to yourself. Yesterday, the guy was serving king. He was captivated by the king. He was giving it to his king. Today, you're doing it for yourself, for your own sake. When Jesus arrived to Mary and Martha's house, Martha was serving. Was she serving Jesus? Yes. Was there a mix of motives? Of course. Because as soon as you poke her, if she sees someone is not doing what she thinks everyone else should do, recognize her and do the same thing, she becomes really irritated. And Jesus says, listen, Mary is captivated by me. You, you're serving, but you're serving yourself. And I've been thinking over that this whole week because it is so applicable to everyone who is doing certain things. Last Sunday, remember, Pastor Eugene said, please play, play for me that my wife doesn't go all the way marry on me. She just comes home and says, you, you survive on your own. I saw Pastor Eugene, he's doing fine. He's not here today, not because, you know, Tanya decided, I'm going to do marry on you all week. And uh, he just, you know, died of starvation. No, he's, he's doing fine, he, he's coming back. He has a wedding today to preach at, at, at so he's hosting a, uh, or leading a wedding ceremony. But going back, I hope many of you are understanding that it's not about either you serve or you listen to Jesus. Because if you, if you just receive that message, I need to be Mary, and so you stop doing anything for your family, I'm going to do Mary on you. I'm tired of Martha's stuff. Or you, you quit your ministry, and I'm not going to preach next Sunday because I'm going to do Mary as well. No. It's not about that, because Mary later, just a few days later, she would take a alabaster flask and break it, and that would be a year worth of salary, and she would serve the king. She would serve Jesus. So it's not about what you do or don't. It's your heart, attitude. And uh, that was a very rebuking and evaluating week for me because see you can love preaching but not love people who's you won't even recognize 
People get excited. They might love to sing, but not to love to sing to the Lord. And it comes out in relationship as well. Wives come and say, I've been doing so much for this husband, and he's not doing anything. Well, of course. Were you serving him selflessly, unconditionally loving him, or you were doing certain things for yourself so that it benefits you? And they get upset because no return. Same thing with husbands. I've been doing, I, lo I love her so much, or I love my kids, and they're, well, did you really love your children or you loved yourself because you invested and now I, I expect return a hundredfold. And so this is so close to doing the right thing it's just for the wrong motive. The reason why it's important to review for us before we dive into our chapter 11 because this is what the chapter 10 concludes in Luke it's the relationship with and fellowship with God that Jesus stresses to Martha. He says, Martha, Martha, why don't you prioritize your fellowship and relationship with God and His Son over things that you do? Because if we don't get that, if I don't understand this, I cannot understand today's passage because it's almost like another card linked to what we just discovered. So today's passage is continuation of that conversation. Fellowship in relationship with God. This is why I called prayer an intimate relationship with God. Okay, so before we dive uh, in, I have uh, one word for our children. Children, today you do have an assignment and I have a small reward for you, so bring your drawings after the service. Here's what you need to draw for me, and I'll keep it after service. You turn it in. Please draw what you will do this week in light of this message. So listen carefully, and what do you think God wants you to do this week? Listen carefully. God, what do you want me to do? Listen to this message. And then draw what you will be doing this week, okay? Oh, for the rest of you, I want to begin with uh, something that we all agree. There are certain things in life that we don't question. They are so fundamental to life, we just function by them. For example, breathing. None of you were thinking up to this point, probably from even morning, that you need to breathe or how many times you, um, 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 a minute you have to breathe? Oh, 15. No, I'm going to do 14 right now. Oh, I'm going to slow down to 13 right now because I'm sitting. You're, you're not thinking of breathing, right? Now, as I'm mentioning this, you start, <gasps> you start thinking, you know, maybe I should breathe more. But we don't. We don't. We don't. We just breathe as much as we, we need whenever we want. And so we understand there are certain things that are just so natural, like heartbeat. We just do that. Our body even does it for us. Well, to some degree, we, we understand the prayer is like that. Because in our spiritual life, it's like breathing. Uh, for believer, prayer is so essential. And we, all, of, all of us churchgoers, if you attend church for a while, you know prayer is something non-negotiable. We don't even think. And unfortunately, sometimes it turns into that. I prayed for a meal, I prayed in the morning, I prayed in, at night, I, I just did it. But we are understanding it is the concept of talking to God. We still not always pause and really think what happens. We not always understand why we should pray and maybe even how it should be done. So today's passage is for that purpose. It explains the essence of prayer. What is prayer really functions for? So this passage will teach us how to pray. This is a model, not a method. Because in verse 1 of chapter 11, we hear this. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, 
And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. He is not saying, teach us, Lord, a prayer. A lot of people reading this, because what follows is our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. You've memorized that. And a lot of people thinking when, when disciples come to Jesus, G G Jesus, teach us a prayer that we've all memorized. No, no, he's not saying a prayer. He's saying teach us to pray. There's a significant difference between uh, saying a prayer and praying. Because one is just a formal exercise. Another is fellowship with God. And disciples specifically went after fellowship. They want to learn to pray rather than a prayer to memorize. Why? Because they see Jesus interacting with his father. Jesus was praying. He was not saying a prayer. He was praying and they looking at him and say, we see fellowship. We want that. Prayer is not a formula to follow, but a conversation to be engaged with. A conversation with a person. It's not a formal thing that you need to repeat. Remember, uh, Peter, Jesus was walking on the water once. And Peter, being Peter, said, it's a cool thing. I want to do the same. Jesus, would you let me go? He says, yeah, come. And so he begins to walk. As he walks, he begins to doubt. He begins to sing. Now, this is the time to pray. And he begins, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. And then you see bubbles. Peter is gone because he needs to repeat this prayer. He's not doing that. He's just saying, Lord, save. Lord, save me. That's it. So it, did he pray? Oh, yeah, did. he did. Did he follow the form? No. But he had the essence. And this is where we're going to go after. It's not the form. It's not just a, a method. It is a model or a pattern that we need to follow. We don't have to recite. And it's great if you memorized and you recite once in a while. We even do that as a church. It's great. But that's not the point. The point is conversation, fellowship, relationship. Okay? Another important observation we have to make before we, we, we dive into this passage, that this passage is in plural form. It is a corporate prayer. It begins, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our, our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Did you catch that? It is for all of us. It is a corporate. It's something that we do together. Unfortunately, prayer has been moved from this corporate realm and it's been individualized so much that it's my private matter. Well, when Jesus introduced prayer, it says, we learn to pray corporately when we do it together. Why? It was back then the issue and it's even more so today because we're living in very individualistic Society. People are so selfish, so self-focused and saturated with self-love. It's all about me. And when they hear, teach us to pray, what they think, I know what they're thinking. A list of things that I need to bring to God, what I need. Laundry list. I need health, family, money, more money, more money, more money. And I submit it to God. That's my prayer. Jesus says, no, it's, it's not about you. In prayer, suddenly you begin to learn to think of others. Give us each day. Forgive us. Lead us not into the... It, we, certainly, we, we begin to train ourselves to think of others along us and also of God. Prayer 
is an exercise for the church. This is why, my friend, if you're visiting and you're not part of the church, you need to be part of a healthy biblical church. Because us is not applicable to you. You're just, give me each day. You, it's still that selfish individualistic life. Jesus places us in the church, in the fellowship. And I, I want to be honest with you. This is where you will eventually learn to pray. Another important note. I mentioned the context. Martha and Mary. And what happened there was all about priorities. Keeping the main thing, main thing. Mainly, relationship with Jesus is more valuable than even serving Jesus. And it's interesting, as Jesus was talking to Martha, he had 12 witnesses. As a minimum, we had disciples sitting right next to Jesus. And those disciples were observing, oh, Martha is doing things, Mary is sitting right there, and Jesus is correcting Martha. And they're, they're trying to understand, make sense of it, and they come to conclusion, it's about fellowship and relationship with God. And therefore, as Jesus is having relationship with his Father in heaven, verse 1 of chapter 11, they say, we want that. We were eyewitnesses of that conversation, and we took the lesson. We need to prioritize relationship with God over everything else. We need to understand the context. If we don't understand that, how can we now learn to pray? Because if you don't, you're going to miss that. So this is not a method we're going to cover today, but a pattern that includes three main elements of prayer. Three, element, three main elements of prayer as an instrument to establish more intimate relationship with God or as a marker of more intimate relationship with God. Three instruments. Number one, three parts in prayer. Number one, the pursuit of prayer. The pursuit. You must eager to pray. You must eager to learn. You must seek it. You must look for it. Verse 1 begins this way. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. There are certain things in life that we don't really want to do, but we do. For example, for some of you, brushing your teeth. It's an extra stuff, and you're tired at night. Some people even say you need to do it after every meal. This is so much headache. But we, we must do it, and I hope you do it. Washing your dishes, not the, the most exciting thing, but we do it. Maybe for some of you, picking up after your dog, not the most pleasant thing. But I hope you do that. Please do that. Especially on my front line. For some of you, it's taking showers. This is what in our house we're struggling right now. Some apparently don't like showers. But we do them anyways, and I hope you do. To some degree, people look at prayer, at prayer the same way. And they're right. And here's what. I've discovered is that it is a battle between flesh and spirit. The flesh wants to sleep in, wants, wants to be and tired at night and standing on your knees, taking an extra five minutes to pray, or even focus your mind. It's better just to pull an iPhone and just scroll down. That's much easier. My mind and prayer, so my flesh is not eager for prayer. But my spirit is longing for that. My heart, my soul is earning that fellowship. And this is where we see it in this verse 1. Disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. They have a desire. They have a desire. So 
if you never had this desire, the, this is very important, my friends. You see, a true believer will have flesh saying, I don't want to pray. will have a spirit, I want to pray. This is the description right here. Disciples only towards the end of Jesus' ministry asking this. So apparently they were eager to sleep and relax and scroll on the internet and browse internet. But towards the end of his ministry, they're, they're having a desire, unique desire to pray. Spirit begins to earn for that. So if you never had it, my prayer today is that while we're studying this passage, God supernaturally gives you that desire. I cannot give you. You cannot produce. God supernaturally cut up these disciples, these disciples, and they, they want to learn. It's a miracle. It's so beautiful when someone comes and says, I want to learn to pray. Now, let's think logically. Who is asking to teach them to pray? One of his disciples, one of his disciples, probably a lot of commentators, probably Peter. He's doing it always for the rest of the crowd. Who is asking? Listen. Disciples are not sinful pagans who go on strikes against prayer, denying God, denying prayer. They're fighting God and saying, no, no prayer. No, we are receiving the request to teach, to pray from very law-abiding Jews. Now, if you know a little bit about Jews, they're big on prayers. They have certain times in the day when they pray, they memorize from childhood long prayers. So they know how to pray. They faithfully pray and pray a lot. Then why do you ask Jesus? You already from childhood know how to pray. You've memorized so many prayers. And you do it so much. Apparently, religious, ritualistic prayer had no effect on them. It did not satisfy their souls. They've said the prayer. They learned a prayer but never learned to pray. Maybe you are like, the, like, like disciples. For 40 years, maybe you've been praying over your meals, at night, in the morning, before you take exams. Nothing wrong with that. But if you're honest, your prayer never gave you satisfaction, never gave you joy, never gave you love toward God. It was just a... Something you forced yourself to do. You never desired that. It is a sign that there's no fellowship. You need to go back to chapter 10. You're probably stuck in Martha. There must be that earning, that desire to fellowship with God Something unique happened when Jesus was praying. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place and it sparked their desire. Jesus was praying and they began to hunger for that. Jesus was so close to his father. Apparently when he was praying, he had real conversation with his father. It was so intimate, so vivid, so exciting so powerful, Jesus would receive strength and guidance right there on spot. And they say, we want that. We've done our religious stuff. For years we've been praying. We've memorized many prayers. But we want that, Jesus. We want that. What was it? Let's look. We, we've, we've covered that a number, number of times. Let's look at prayer life of Jesus. A few windows that we we're going to look into. I'm going to invite you to kind of 
run through the Gospel of Luke up to the chapter 11, um, beginning in chapter 3, verse 21. One, now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, next verse, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Jesus, I want that. You are praying, heaven is open, Holy Spirit is coming, and the Father is speaking. I want that kind of prayers. I'm glad you, you, you see this. This is exciting. This is amazing. Jesus begins to pray and heaven is open. Chapter 5, verse 16. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. He would do that regularly. Chapter 6, verse 12, 13. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles. When he makes a major decision, he must pray. And it was a very prayerful decision. He was guided by Father through prayer to choose his disciples. Chapter 9, verse 18. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? It was a very prayerful question, and we know Peter answered, You are the Christ of God. That revelation to Peter came through Jesus' prayerful question. He was praying for that. He was praying for the right answer. He was praying for the right question. Same chapter, 28, verse 28. Now, about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And we know the whole story of transfiguration. It was during prayer. When Jesus begins to pray, glory appears, glorious things, exciting things. This is not just you're forced upon you something religious. It's an it's exciting fellowship. Chapter 10, verse 21. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, he's rejoicing, he's in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise, wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Christ's pr prayers were real. And what's exciting about it, they were very contagious. He inspired his disciples to such degree that they say, we're going to ask you, and this is the only request they ask. Recorded in the New Testament. Lord, teach us to pray. This is how you can evaluate your prayer life. Friends, parents, is your prayer life getting people around you excited for prayer? This is, this is how you... Jesus would pray and it eventually led disciples to hunger for that. I see that you, your prayer changes you. Things change. God is answering you. God is working through your prayer. I want that. I've done religious. I've memorized. I do that religiously. I want fellowship that you have. Guidance that you receive. Strength that you receive from prayer. Through prayer. Is your prayer inspiring others to pray? This is how you evaluate whether you... You are really praying. You're seeking prayer. Now, many of you know that this prayer, as we were reading it, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Reminds you of another prayer that Jesus taught. He did teach this prayer 
in Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, it's in the middle of three chapter sermon called Sermon on the Mount. He begins in chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. Right in the middle of, chapter, of his sermon, he drops this teaching on prayer. When you pray, pray this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. And he is almost word by word, slightly different, taught them already. Now, if you follow word by word and compare the two prayers, you will re recognize these are two different prayers. Even though they're very similar because the idea, the concept, the pattern is the same for every prayer. But it is different because the, the one that we find in Matthew 6 is in Galilee and a few months before the one that we find here in Luke and it's in Judea and a few months later and slightly different wording. Why am I saying this? Why we need to make this observation? Because it's an encouragement for you and me. Jesus has already taught them, but they did not learn it which is encouragement for every pastor, every preacher. Who, if you're, you're preaching to your Sunday school classes, you're leading your home group, and you explain something, and you're thinking what? I've explained it once, everyone got it. Jesus explained it in Matthew 6, nobody got it. In other words, learning to fellowship with God in prayer is a process. And I need to add a long process of learning. It's a growth. It's maturity that you obtain over time. So don't get discouraged if after listening to today's message, you're going to go home and pray earnestly and you get up. Where are disciples asking me to teach them? Nobody's asking me to teach. Take some time. It will be a long process. And you will grow in it. And people around you will grow. But listen, Jesus is so interesting. He was waiting for that request. He didn't teach them to pray a day before or when they were visiting Martha and Mary. That would be a nice setting. Disciples are right there. Everyone is sitting, having a meal. Great time to teach them how to pray. Guys, by the way, let me teach you. No, he is waiting for them to ask. He's waiting for them. You can answer the question if it's asked. Jesus was waiting for this moment, and the right moment came. The prayer is something that only those who want will learn. If you don't want, if you have no desire, conversation today has no relevance for you. No relevance. You're going to just say, I don't get anything today. And I agree with you, because you don't want. But disciples begin with, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, this is the beginning of prayer. Do you want to pray? Is there spirit within you longing to pray? Or it's all flesh and it's just phew, prayer for religious people. I have no idea what it is for. Or maybe as we study today, as we look at Jesus, suddenly you have that urge, that desire. I want to pray. I want to have that. I want to have that. I've done a number of prayers. I even memorized... Our Father who is in heaven. I've memorized that prayer, but I want fellowship. I want fellowship. You're in the right place. Then, then you're right track. So number one, first part of prayer is the pursuit of prayer. You must pursue it. If you don't, you're not going to learn. You're not going to grow. Number two, the praise in prayer. Verse 2 introduces us to another very important element of prayer. It's not only we desire that prayer, but we also in that prayer worship God. We praise Him. We focus our attention at Him. It must be God-centered prayer. Look at verse 2. And He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be Your name, Your kingdom come. All these requests in the following chapter, uh, verse 3 and 4, all except one, where we ask for, give us each day our daily bread. They're in Greek form that stresses the request that it must be done. It's urgent. Would you do this? But it doesn't ask for the process. In other words, when we ask, we cannot prescribe 
the way that God is going to answer, how his name is going to be hallowed, how his ki kingdom will come. We don't know. We cannot tell God even how the process of forgiving our sins, like all the mechanism, we just ask, would you do this? And he will accomplish. We just sometimes cannot trace the process completely. The first request in verse 2, they're all God-centered. Concerning God, not our needs. Do you know that this is a good way to evaluate if someone is praying and you're listening to them and that person is mature? Maturity comes with God-centeredness. Infants in Christ, those who are just like little babies, if you, have a, if you ever will have or you had a little baby, they're very selfish. Oh, yes. They want food from day one. They, they need their diapers changed. They're not, never stopping like a three-month-old. See, hey, Dad, how, how can I help you today? No, they're just me, me, me for years. Maybe then, you know, when they're 18. Dad, by the way, can I do something for you? And you're shocked. Your jaw drops. But, no, 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 you kids, you, you, you do a great job. I know many of you are, you know, when you're already two and you just learn talking, you're already asking for opportunities to serve. But generally speaking, let's say, generally speaking, infants in Christ, they begin prayer. God, give, 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 give. And only mature people begin with, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Now he begins with our father or father. Speaks of relationship. Speak. This is a title that is used to describe relationship. You know that. You know that in your family. I taught my kids when they were growing up and still growing up to call me dad, not dude. And not by my name. Uncle Dmitri, can I have a milk? I will be offended. I, I want them to come and say, Dad or Father or Daddy even better. Why? Have you ever thought about that? That you are calling your father Father and not by his name, official name, first name, or even last name. Mr. Zerebnenkov, you, you will be offended. Why, 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 why do you do that? Have you ever thought? Because from, child, from childhood, we teach our children that I am their father and I am in relationship. Children, this is why you call your parents dad and mom, father and mother. And you should do that. Because by doing that, you are stressing one element, relationship. That's it. Now, you say, we got it, it's easy. Okay. Not so much with disciples. Not, th this was so radical for them to hear. You, you, you mean we need to pray to God, the, the creator of universe, Yahweh, Lord, host, Lord of hosts, we should call him Daddy, Father? That's radical. Do you know that only 15 times in Old Testament we find uh, the title Father used toward God and it's always to describe his relation toward the whole uh, nations or people in general. Never to specific group of people or never to specific person. It's always a, just he's a father of all creation. And suddenly Jesus is teaching them, listen, when you pray, you guys just get together and say, our Father. That was so radical for them. Why? The answer comes in John chapter 1. Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 12. John explains. But to all who did receive Him, speaking Christ, those who received Christ by faith, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
And if you are a child of God, that means God is your father. He adopted you in his family. But the right is given only to those who believe. So Jesus came, and by believing in him and his work on the cross, every person now has opportunity to come into that close relationship with God. That's obvious. And as believers, then we begin to talk to him like that. It, Romans chapter 8, verse 15 and 16. Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You see, this is the uniqueness of the New Testament, that through Jesus, we have adoption now. This is why we call God our Father. But as soon as he mentions that, in, in verse 2, Father, comma, immediately he adds, hallowed be your name. Now, we don't use that word hallowed too often. You can replace it, be sanctified your name, be set apart your name. So it's interesting combination of Father, which is so intimate, so close. It's a relationship between Father and Son and Child. And then hallowed be your name is almost like the opposite. Father, you're so close, and yet your name should be set apart, sanctified. We understand that. We understand that when you go, we, if if President of the United States invites you ever to his office, you're going to go visit. By the way, don't forget to take me with you. But when you come there, two things. First, you're going to be talking to him like a to normal person. Probably you're going to use the same words. You're not going to be... Uh, uh, uh. Hopefully you say, hi, Mr. President. How are you? Uh, would you give me some money? Whatever you're going to say, you're going to say it like to a normal person. But then at the same time, you will remember that you're talking to a president of the United States. You will probably make sure that you're dressed appropriately, you behave appropriately because it's a president of the United States. So we understand that you can be intimate and you can still honor that person. Many interpreters at this point studying this passage say, well, hallowed be your name. And they're partially right. They say under name of God means or implied all of his nature, all of his attributes, his character, his abilities, his will, his desire, everything. Who he is, his essence, to be hallowed. And they say it's, it's the whole who God is to be sanctified, set apart. But if we look at the context, right before that hallowed be your name, he says, Father, the context demands that out of all the attributes and titles that God has, one is specifically stressed here, Father. So he, he brings this interesting tension between intimate relationship with the Father and yet that name to be sanctified and cared and, and loved and cherished and valued and respected. Let me bring a biblical argument behind this. John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, it's so-called high priestly prayer by Jesus. He prays to his father. And this is the way he concludes this sermon, uh, this prayer. I'm sorry. So if you're in John 17, look at verse 25, 26. This is how he concludes. O righteous father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these, speaking of disciples and those who will believe through them, they know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name. And I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me 
may be in them and I in them. Now, if you take the context, he's talking to the father. And he says, love that you love as a father. You love me. I want the same love to be transferred to them. And I revealed your name to them. You cannot deny the reality that Jesus is talking about his father in heaven. He begins this prayer this way in chapter 17, verse 1. And Jesus spoke, had spoken these words. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. And he continues the whole prayer is Son speaking to his Father. The Son is speaking. The Father is answering. And then he invites and says, I revealed your name as a father to these people. Now why? why? Why is this important? Because at the same time as we love the intimate relationship with the father, we must especially value, treasure, respect, and love. We should not turn this into something like, oh, dad. Like some prefer daddy, just casual daddy, almost on the edge of dude. You cannot. Father, and at the same time, there is a reverence before God. We should love, value, and treasure that. It's a unique. The Old Testament saints... Didn't have a clue that it's possible that we can get so close to God. What follows is the desire for the kingdom of God to spread both in our lives and on this earth. Your kingdom come. Two texts that will help us to understand Father's kingdom. God's kingdom come. In the same Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verse 43. We read this, 443. But he said to them, Jesus saying to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Apparently, this kingdom is transferred, carried about, spread through preaching. So it's definitely not the sword, definitely not politics. It's through the preaching. He, in, Jesus says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God. So this kingdom is traveling through the preaching, through the teaching. In the same gospel, chapter 7, Luke 7, 28 I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Speaking of John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is at least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people heard this and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. Now, John the Baptist also preached the kingdom. And he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. And what he meant, repent and believe. And they were baptized. And that baptism was the baptism of repentance. And the people rejoicing here that they are part of that kingdom. It's the kingdom in the heart. It's the kingdom that's traveling and spreading Throughout the world, even now, through the preaching of God's word. And he said, listen, when you pray, focus on your relationship. And yet, at the same time, have reverence. And when you think of God, think of his kingdom, that it may spread. And your kingdom come in my personal life and in the life of, of those around me and on this earth. And eventually, ushering into his earthly kingdom here on earth. This is the second part of prayer. Jesus explains the heart attitude, the mind, 
you must be focused on God, on who He is, what relationship you have with Him, and His kingdom and His will and His plans on this earth. It must be God-centered. Is your prayer God-centered? Can people learn theology from your prayer? Can they learn who God is through your prayer? Do you worship God as you pray? Third part of prayer, the plea for prayer. The plea in prayer, I'm sorry. The plea in prayer, verses 3 and 4, give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. The present tense for the bread, give us each day daily bread, stresses that it is an ongoing process. We always need bread, but also we're going to come back to it later on. He will expand using this line to explain how we ought to ask. But it's interesting if we go back. Give us each day our daily bread. Are you disappointed? Those of you who are not eating gluten and bread. Why is he not asking for ice cream? And give us each day our daily ice cream. Kids, daily portion of candies. Or something else, cookies. He's saying bread. Bread is the image of something so fundamental to life, something so common, something basic. It's not luxury. It's something so basic for life. In other words, he's, ask, he's asking, listen, when you pray, ask that God just provides the basics. Give us each day salted caramel ice cream. No, it doesn't fit here. In other words, we need to come and ask for basic necessities. He says, yes, you need to depend. It's, it's our way of expressing. We depend on you. We don't need a luxury. We don't need excess. We just need enough. Then he continues. And forgive us our sins. Forgive us our sins. In John chapter 1, uh, 1 John 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, we all know this passage. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? Because unconfessed sin prevents prayer from being heard. Listen. Unconfessed sin prevents prayers to be heard. If you are hindering if you're hiding in your heart in your life sin and you cherish it and you don't want to give it up you don't want to confess it you don't want to repent of it that sin is going to keep you away from being hurt by god god is not going to listen psalm 66 interesting psalm 66 verse 18 19 if i had cherished iniquity in my heart unconfessed sin i'm holding on to the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. In other words, He has confessed His sins. And because of that, His prayer was heard. You say, that's the Old Testament, probably New Testament. No, it doesn't matter what you do. God is just good with you. He's the Father, and He's he always eager to listen, even if you're living in a messed up life. No. I have a good example from memory. You know this. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, you husbands, live with your wives. In what way? Who remembers? Huh? In an understanding way. The rest of you guys, husbands, you're in trouble today. I know you're in trouble. You need to understand your wife. Why? Showing her honor as a weaker vessel. And then the end of that verse, so that your prayers may not be what? Hindered. Here's your New Testament example of you not loving your wife, living in a sinful relationship or sinful attitude toward your wife. God says, 
I'm sorry, I'm not listening to you. Unconfessed sin that you cherish becomes an obstacle. And this prayer recognizes that it says, forgive us our daily. Forgive us. Forgive us our sins. So we must do that. It's a, something that we're going to come back to that because we're living in a sinful flesh. And we're living in a sinful world and we need constant cleansing. We have to pray this prayer. Some people say, no, we just do it once and for all. No. This prayer says you come back to that. More than that, it says that the forgiven person must become forgiven person. The forgiven must become the forgiven did you catch that? The forgiven must become forgiving. Verse 4, And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. You cannot say, God, forgive my sins, but I'm not going to let go others of others. No. Matthew 18, Jesus even shared it, told this parable specifically to describe that there was a guy who owned 10,000 talents to one of the, his masters and the master called him and said, you got to pay 10,000. It's impossible for him. He says, I cannot, master. He says, okay, I forgive you. I forgive you. Go. He comes out and sees a little friend and he says, you, how much you owe me? Yeah, a couple bucks. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you, man. Give me this couple bucks. And the master learned of that and says, listen, you're so contrary to what I am, who I am. I am a forgiven and my forgiveness must change you from within. So that you become forgiven. But because you didn't, oh, you're in trouble. Pay all of that. Back to me. So, this is a very important, friends. If we ask, forgive us our sins, but we will not forgive others, you are pronouncing condemnation of yourself. So it's a very important prayer that actually if we say forgive us as we forgive others. It demands that we forgive if we ask for forgiveness constantly. We've been forgiven. We've been forgiven. Unless you are not forgiven. Then today seek that forgiveness. So prayer is the aspiration of the soul of a believer who understands that God is his father. There is intimate relationship and he's eager to strengthen that relationship through prayer. And that God has warm and great disposition toward this child. The prayer becomes God-centered. It's focused, it's focused on what God is doing and who God is. And in light of that, yes, we do bring our petitions. We do bring our requests with necessities in life, like daily bread, and our spiritual need, because we need to fight sin, we need to overcome, and we don't want to fall into temptation. We need Him to keep us away from acting in sin when testing comes. It's not a form. It's not a method. It's a pattern to follow. Sometimes you will pray for an hour. Sometimes it will be just one sentence. But in any case, it is a relationship with the living God. That's what prayer is. Gospel. I want to mention the gospel. Because this prayer outlines simply what the gospel is. The gospel is a person looking from the side on this conversation, realizing... I believe in God, but I don't think I have a relationship like this. I cannot call him father. I can say that God is, and he is the creator, and he does a lot of things, and he's sovereign. I agree with all of this. But to call him my father, I dare not, because I am not a child of God. That's where you need to realize, is there such a relationship between you and God that he calls you his child, and you call him his, your father. Why? Why it's important? Because we all have sinned. Romans 8, uh, 3.23 says that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory. Relationship between the father and 
the child has been broken, God is still there. It's just there's no relationship. There's no family and only through Christ who becomes our substitutionary atonement, replacement for us. We have access back into the family. We're invited back in the family. Now, of course, some people, even after listening to all of this, say, but I still don't have a desire. I understand. John 16, 8 says that when the Holy Spirit come, he will come and convince the world of the sin. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And if, and if today, as we study this passage, you realize maybe for the first time, I don't have a relationship. I believe in God, but He's not my Father. Today, seek forgiveness of your sins. And He, like in the parable of the prodigal son, He is eager to receive His son back in fellowship and he wants to embrace you and he says my son is back i love him he is my truly son and he's eager to establish that relationship he has done all that's needed for that to happen would you receive his invitation and repent of your sins confess forgive us our sins and he's eager to receive you for the first time I want to invite all of you to stand and we will pray as we conclude. Our Heavenly Father, we're so used to say that, but after reading this passage, after meditating, when we say, Father, it is so close. When we say father, it is so intimate. Like between a child and the father. That means that your love is toward your children. And it is unconditional. Good father never turns away from his children. Even if, not if, even when they fail. And they do fail. Oh, we fail. But because you are our Father, you don't give up on us. Because you are, you are our Father, we can say, forgive us our sins. Give us our daily bread. And we have confidence. Our loving Father will provide. We pray for those who hearing today about prayer realized they have looked for years at prayer as something that religious people do it's part of a ritual to be christian and they realized it's it is about relationship it is about fellowship it is about about god and us knowing him would they embrace that relationship that you provide you extend that invitation today through this passage like no other. You want to be their father. You want to forgive their sins. You want to be their provider. Oh, how great and amazing the changes when, when one comes into God's family. There's so much joy. It brings satisfaction. It satisfies. That kind of prayer leave us, leaves us satisfied with you so that we're okay with just bread here. We don't need extra stuff here on earth. You are our bread and you are our satisfaction and joy. Thank you for a simple reminder today. Father, we ask once again, teach us Continue to teach us to pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.